So uh, next up is a panel moderated by myself. So I'd like to introduce myself as the moderator. Uh, the title of the panel is Metrics Before Models. And I'd like to invite our panelists up to the stage. We have uh, Michelle Casbon from Cordoba. We have jean ri Meng from Databricks and Leah McGuire from Salesforce. Come on up. Choose, choose your seat. Yeah, okay, there you go. I'm going to stand. So, <laughs> so make yourself comfortable. So the the theme of this panel, I, I think I think I stole your idea, Leah, and ran with it and sort of um, modified it. Metrics before models, and I'd like to actually morph this into a conversation about the intersection of data science and engineering. Uh, I myself am, I guess, known as a data scientist, but I'm, I'm really much more of a, an engineer by heart. And so I'm particularly myself interested in, this, in these types of questions. Um, what, how, what can data science learn from engineering? What is the overlap like? Um, before we get into some questions, maybe we could just do a round of introductions. Zhang yeah. Ri. Uh, yeah, I'm Zhang Ri. So I'm a software engineer from Databricks. Uh, I contribute and uh, help uh, managing uh, the mo machine learning component of Spark uh, called MLLib. And also, I'm just uh, leading a small group of uh, data scientists and uh, engineers at Databricks. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm Michelle Casbon. I'm head of data science at Cordoba, which is a startup that helps companies make localization a lot less painful. And I'm sort of the first data scientist in the company. They've already done a lot of natural language processing, but I'm coming in to augment that and do a bit more sophisticated things. And I'm working with a few of the existing engineers. I'm Leah McGuire. I'm at Salesforce, so basically for the last year and a half, and I've been working on uh, building out a machine learning platform for Salesforce to really take all of our clients' data and do intelligent things on top of it. Um, before that, I was at LinkedIn. So. Fantastic. Well, okay, Leah, I think the first question goes to you since you suggested the topic of this panel. Um, you called metrics the unit testing of data science. Mm -hmm. Elaborate, please. All right. Well, I think um, unit tests really tell you when things are going to break. And uh, metrics do the same thing, right? So if you set up good coverage on your metrics, you know when you've broken something. And if you don't have that coverage, you don't know when something's going to break. You don't know if it's been broken. Um, and that's exactly what unit tests are there for. So it's basically, if you have good metrics, you're going to catch your mistakes. And if you don't, then you're just out in the open exposed. So I think that's really how that So works. what kind of metrics would you collect? If you're a data scientist, what, what do you need um, to know? So I think you need to know, so everything you can, everything that you can think of, really. So when your data is coming in, you need to know, you need to do the counts, you need to know like the raw numbers, um, you need to know when it's processed, are the numbers coming out of your processing step the same as the raw numbers going in? Um, so sort of if you've got an ETL pipeline, making sure that you're measuring what's going in, what's coming out, uh, making sure that those numbers really sync up. Um, if you're doing any sort of uh, machine learning processing, um, basically you need to go in and say, okay, I'm doing all this data transformation. Is the transformed data related to the original data that goes in or has my transformation actually like lost something, uh, skewed the metrics, like really just done something horrible? Um, and then you, know, you need to know uh, how your model is performing um, both on whatever you're training the model on, so the particular metric that you're optimizing for, but then more broadly on the metrics that maybe you can't optimize for but are the ones you really care about. So if you're training a model and it's based on clicks, but what you really care about is engagement, you need to have sort of the measurement of, okay, well, I've got my clicks, and yes, the model was designed to improve clicks, that's really happening, but is it making my, my users happier? Is it actually improving engagement, or is it hurting engagement? Um, because sometimes you have to make these compromises, but if you're really tracking the things you care about, then you can see, okay, was that compromise working, or do I really need to go back to the drawing board and try and model something more relevant? Right, so we may be optimizing for some proxy of what we really exactly. want, and we get what we, what we asked for and not what we wanted. Exactly. And uh, I also find that you know, machine learning is something that can, f its failure modes are more silent, right? Mm -hmm. So if uh, your unit test fails and causes um, you know, the database to be corrupted, you probably hopefully catch that. But if your metrics are a little bit off, if the model's a little bit wrong, it's, you know, it's not obvious that's happened. 
So Michelle, you've built a couple end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines in your day. I mean, tell me about your experience measuring, testing the output of these models and feeling confident that your, your process is actually working. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, just like Leah said, metrics are super important. Um, one of my first jobs as an ETL developer was to create sanity checks for a lot of the pipelines that were already in place. And I remember spending the better part of like three months trying to dig into code that had already been written, and that is a lot harder to do. If you're writing code as a data scientist and you have an idea of what that code should be doing, you should be the one writing those metrics. Um, don't leave that to the engineering teams because someone who operationalizes it will know a lot less about the things that, the, you know, the, the breakpoints. Um, every time the data moves somewhere, you should be checking it. You should be validating that the data that came in is the same as the data that came out. And uh, unit tests, I think the first code that I that I committed to Cordoba was all unit tested. And I think the engineering team was just shocked. They didn't expect that from a data scientist. Uh, yeah, everything, every touch point, everything you can think of, everything that you think might be a problem, check it, write a test for it. Make sure, yeah, make, so testing should be a, a regular part of the data science discipline as well, not just something engineers do. Um, so Jean Green, um, I mean, you and I have both worked on Spark a lot. We're familiar with uh, Spark as a tool for data scientists. How do you see people, um, check metrics, uh, troubleshoot pipelines, understand if their pipeline's even working. Uh, how do you see people do that with, maybe in the context of Spark? So for Spark, uh, people can just uh, describe their transformations in just uh, small stages. And then for each stage, and they can, for example, Spark provide the UI, and you can see the metrics, you can see the number of records getting in and getting out. And then when you move to machine learning, and you can also measure, for example, the input columns, and are they, do you have, uh, enough number of features in this stage and uh, will be the output stage. And then when you enter this model tuning and we try to see, give you all the metrics you want and you can do a cross -valid validation on top of that. And more importantly, so you want to reapply. So once you do some, uh, just a pipelines running and you want to reapply that pipeline and you should expect a reproducible result. And we try to make sure while we don't throw in some randomness in uh, our maybe implementation and make sure you see the number here, next time you rerun it, you see the same number. And just give you enough confidence about your pipeline. And we also try to see, put a lot of instrumentation code inside the algorithm and just for you to um, debugging purposes. Yeah. Right, so sometimes tool support is essential to, to debugging and just even sanity checking. I mean, I agree, just looking at the outputs of various stages in a pipeline and making sure the, the number of records even makes sense is, a, is something we should all be doing right. as we look. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think I've got an a, a open question to the panel. I would love to hear a story about a time a model went wrong or that when not using metrics or, or choosing the wrong metric led to disastrous or comical mm -hmm. results or maybe both yep. at the same time. Do you have any good anecdotes about, about uh, things going wrong because you didn't measure, <laughs> so, you didn't test. I think, um, so I have something that's, that's not quite not measuring, but I guess, well, it was, it was both not measuring and not thinking things through completely. The first uh, data product that I worked on at LinkedIn um, was actually personalizing most mobile navigation. Um, and so what that meant was like for each person we wanted to just put the things that you use at the top of your mobile navigation so that you could get to them more easily. And the idea was that, oh, users would love this, it would be so easy and, and show them that we really cared about what they were doing. Um, and so we went ahead and we built this and it was part of the new app and we launched it. Um, and we uh, held back, so part of the disaster, or the problem was, so we just launched it with the app, right? We didn't like scale it out gradually and see what the effect was. We launched it to most of the people and held back just a small group to see if it was working well. So sort of the reverse of how you'd want to scale things in. Um, <laughs> and uh, basically what we found when we looked at it was that if you put just the things that people do the most, you know, you get uh, who viewed my profile at the top and then that's all people do. And so you sort of decrease people's usage of the app by putting this one thing that, like, you're giving them a shortcut to the one thing that they really want and not um, encouraging them to interact with more parts of the app. And so for something like navigation, really what you want is sort of some combination of what people want and what you want them to do. And it shouldn't necessarily be uh, skip around everything that you, that you really want people to do. So. Uh, it sounds like you've got an anecdote as well. 
Yeah, so, well, it's very typical story. It's uh, basically you want to just, uh, once we build a model around some features we collected from uh, users, and including, for example, the cluster size, uh, how big uh, our customers are running Spark, used to run Spark. And then, well, the model just uh, went wrong. And we look at the data, and then we realize, okay, someone changed the unit. It's from terabytes to gigabytes. Okay, the, the entire thing is wrong. And, it, well, this is, very typical, I, I guess. You collect the features from different sources, and if you don't monitor, well, the, at least monitor the average uh, variance of that feature, and it will give you a lot of confidence in your model. So it's just a lesson learned. <laughs> right, so just, just some basic data, um, yes. uh, no. semantics problems coming in. Okay. Now, how did you catch that? How did you catch that problem? Yeah, for that one, it's really, well, we catch that after we realize, okay, the model is wrong. And then, well, when we go back, and we can see it. And then next time, we try to just say, let's just uh, monitor all of them and see whether, well, they work, work as expected. Right, so once bitten, twice. OK, fair enough, fair enough. So then you put the monitoring in place to make sure the data made sense. Leah, likewise, how did you realize this was what was happening? Um, so fortunately, we had um, the holdout group uh, that we had done. And we also noticed, oh, look, our um, sort of engagement with the new app has, has gone down on a number of different areas within the app. And so then it was sort of digging in and troubleshooting um, where that was coming from and figuring out that we had you know, made this fundamental mistake in our thinking about navigation. Um, so you were able to dig out some metrics that then you know, yeah. gave you the clues. OK. Yeah. Um, now, Michelle, you have talked often about the, you know, the, the intersection of data science and engineering from an organizational perspective. So a lot of the fixes here involve maybe um, fixing, well, maybe uh, engineering making a change that changed the data and the data science team didn't know about that. How, would, how should we think about um, improving our team interactions to make sure stuff like that doesn't happen? Yeah, so I was recently looking for a new position, and so I got a lot of visibility into a lot of different data science and engineering teams and how they were structured, the types of projects they were working on, and how those teams were working together. I asked so many questions along those lines. How, how are these teams organized? And one of the best organizational structures that I saw was actually on Leah's team um, over at Salesforce IQ. I really like that, uh, we were talking about this earlier, that a lot of people from, from LinkedIn went through some very specific things and they learned a lot from it. And I feel like their organization does a lot of things right. So, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but I really like the way they're, they have um, data scientists and data engineers as, as titles. And from a management perspective, they roll up to a data scientist or a data engineer. But operationally, they have these really um, liquid teams where data scientists will often work on engineering roles. And so on a project by project basis, there's really no hard distinction. And what that means is that everyone has access to the same tools, right? There's no extra step of having to say, hey, can, can, I, can I get this tool installed or can you give me access to this system? It's already sort of baked in because the assumption is that each one of the people is, each, that every team member is able to do everything else. And, and they're pretty good about pairing up stronger data scientists with engineers that want to get stronger in data science and vice versa. And I really love that model. That was pretty unique among a lot of the companies that I talked to. Um, and that's definitely a goal for me at Cordoba as I sort of build out the data science team is to stay very involved in what's going on in engineering. And I realized, like, just the other day, actually, I realized that I was kind of out of the loop on what was going on in engineering because I hadn't sort of been invited to all these meetings. And so I was kind of like, hey, hey, can you send me that calendar invite? Like, I really want to know what's going on operationally because I kind of feel blind. And Coming from, so both my degrees are in computer science, I've done a lot of engineering work, and that, that comes very naturally to me. And coming from these roles where I was always just sort of um, part of these meetings naturally, where I didn't have to work to be part of them, having that all of a sudden missing in this new role is, is I think, uh, something that someone who hasn't ever been in a heavy engineering role wouldn't necessarily identify. And so I think it's very important for engineering teams to pull in data scientists at a lot of points in the process and, and for data scientists to really ask to be involved. And, and you don't have to necessarily get heavily involved, but I do think it's important to at least understand 
the pain that each team is feeling because when you understand where the pain points are, then you can work to help correct those in your respective areas. And, and the more we can all work together, I think, the better. So I think just to, to say one thing is one of the things that we found really important in our team is to sort of not just hand things off, right? You sort of you see the process all the way through um, and you may work with someone who's more skilled in a particular area to really finish the implementation. Um, but you're making sure that, you know, if you want a metric to go in, you see it end to end and you're really making sure that you didn't, you know, just describe it to some uh, engineer who didn't quite get what you were saying and implemented something that wasn't exactly the metric you needed and then, you know, everything goes bad. So really just making sure that everyone can work together on the whole process. Yeah. So from the very beginning, maybe just hire a data scientist who can write production code <laughs> and hire engineers who can make beautiful dashboard. And uh, just the test those in your interviews. <laughs> so that actually segues nicely into uh, maybe another question, an open question here. So we've long debated what the word data scientist means, and I think we've all seen the Venn diagram, and it apparently it involves some engineering, and it involves some statistics, and it involves some domain knowledge. <clears throat> and I think you're all suggesting that data scientists and engineers should work closely together. Yes, uh, but that kind of implies they can each crew to do each other's jobs, or the engineers might understand enough about the data science to not do the wrong thing, that the data scientists can actually write production code in, a, in the same language that the engineers are, are writing in. Um, is this realistic? Should we have general um, unicorns that can do both, or should we have specialist teams that can work well together? Wh which is better or feasible? I think that diversity is really important. The more, I mean, obviously no one is going to be good at everything, but people that are really strong in certain areas, as long as they're open to learning new things, I, I think that you should have balanced strengths on, on any team. Um, and, and I also think it's important to not have these sort of, like how important are titles in your organization, not, not have these sort of competitive situations. And, and one of the areas that people don't necessarily think about, I kind of talked about tooling earlier and access to systems. Sometimes you'll see an entire data science team all with Macs, and then the engineers are like stuck with PCs. Sorry for anyone who likes PCs, but like little things like that. Um, just to relate this to um, a story, I was going on this long distance cycling trip, and a friend and I both needed to buy a bike to go this 700 miles, right? So we both had very different ideas of what we needed. I was inexperienced, so I needed something that would get me really far with very little effort. So I ended up with this like barely used carbon specialized bike. And he's kind of a hipster, he's more experienced. And so he had this like 70s old steel frame original um, barely modified bike. And we were both going down the exact same route, literally side by side. And we were both so happy because we had exactly what we needed. So like within the general guidelines of achieving the same goal, you definitely want to be on the same page, but you don't have to force data scientists to use really hardcore engineering tools. They can still be very productive and, and vice versa. Like everyone should definitely be on the same page, but you don't necessarily have to force everyone into a shoebox. You know, let them be productive in their own way. People can work together really well if they understand the pinpoints of each other. And then just understand why, for example, as a data scientist, why you cannot give me data in 10 seconds, right? So that's a good question. And also another thing is uh, we need to think about how to build tools to make people talk to each other. They, basically, they speak different languages. And one thing we did in Spark is uh, we tried to provide, for example, one implementation of uh, some algorithm but provide uh, just uh, APIs in Java, in Scala, in R. And that means uh, data scientists, uh, usually they use R, and they train a model, and they cannot just say, give it to a software engineer or deploy this model for me, and this is the R code to try to understand it. But we try to build a single implementation and just put the wrappers, and then when an R user train a model, and then save as a, some data file, and then the software engineer can just load it back and using Java or using Scala. And that may work their maybe life easier by talking to each other smoothly. Yeah, I, I think um, you sort of, uh, generally we hire for strength in one area, but willingness to learn other areas. So as long as you're willing to you know, take the time to really understand, you can sort of have enough breadth to work together with strengths in complementary areas, and you don't have to find it. That is good unicorn. news, because I, I think I'm actually Pretty good engineer, but I'm faking it as a, as a statistician, so <laughs> thank you. Um, on this subject, do you see any convergence in the tools that people use, though? Uh, I mean, um, you know, 10 years ago, yeah, data scientists, they're the people that are using R. 
Um, systems engineers, sure, they're building something on the JVM. Are we seeing some convergence in the workflows, in the tools, even as we maintain these as sort of separate roles? Are, are we seeing some overlap? I think yeah. we have to yeah. because you can't just develop an algorithm in one language and expect for that to translate. I mean, that's kind of the, the age-old story about the engineers, like, oh, that library doesn't even exist in Java. What are they thinking? And so I think you know, if you ever want to build something together, you, you have to converge on a tool set. You have to agree on something that works for both parties. I mean, it, it, would it be fair to say that Python is a good middle ground in that's many cases? Exactly. Yeah. What I was it's unfortunate for me. I'm not a Python person myself. So. But um, Zhongri, what do you think? What, what's been, uh, what's seen the most growth language-wise in Spark for, the, for these production use cases? Yeah, so we're doing this uh, Spark survey for 2016, and we try to see well, what language is the most popular ones. But based on our experiences, uh, Python is uh, used most often by data scientists uh, who also use Spark. And, but outside Spark, maybe there are more R users uh, who are data scientists. And uh, people are getting just uh, started with Scala and Java as well. It's, uh, yeah, one, thing, one good thing about this is, uh, well, we are kind of studying how people do data science, right? So it's not just uh, how to just uh, uh, analyze, how to analyze data, it's to understand how people do data science, what libraries they use, and what languages they use, for example, for a particular application, and what algorithm they pick, and how long does it take, usually take to just uh, to get some results. And I think that's uh, very interesting, maybe, well, future directions. So can we use data science to understand how people do data science? Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> well, do you have any interesting anecdotes, any initial results, and anything uh, so, that's jumped out at you so far? Uh, let me, well, well, one a common story, when we just uh, start do, doing some POCs with customers, one common question is, uh, so I have a one terabyte of data coming in every day. Uh, how big uh, the Spark cluster I need? Right, so how much memory I need? Well, it's a hard question to answer. You need, well, some experience. You see, based on my experience, you need a cluster of 500 mega, uh, maybe gigabytes. Um, but actually, think about this. We have the data, right? So we, kind of, we can see how users are using Spark and using other tools to do data science. And we can collect those data and actually analyze how people do data science. That's uh, basically data science on top of data science. And then we can answer those questions. Oh, based on uh, our data, and maybe you are in the maybe medium uh, quantile, and to say, well, you need this, um, this uh, amount of memory for your work. And then if you want to do this uh, application, I can tell you 50% of users are using this algorithm. And who, people who pick this library also pick that. Some, similar like Amazon, you're just uh, selling this uh, library, selling algorithms to your customers, but for them to do data science. Interesting. So the answer is always going to be use random forests, right? That, and that's going to be the, the, the tip your machine. I can already predict that's what yeah. your model is going to say. Um, well, to, to kind of wind down the panel here, I'd like to pose one more question to everyone. Um, you've got two sides of your brain inside. You've got the data scientist or the statistician. You've got the engineering side. What's the most important tip you would give from one side of your personality to the other? What would you like engineers to hear most from data scientists or, or vice versa? Tough one, yes, <laughs> we have time. So for example, you know, thinking from my experience, um, indeed, I think that often uh, the, the groups of people we encounter that are analysts or data scientists, they, um, they, they view their role as to make the model and that's it, not productionize it, or not necessarily uh, know or care where the data came from, or not necessarily have any agency in the process of collecting the data. And that seems like a missed opportunity. So it seems like, I mean, my, I personally always encourage the analyst teams, the R users, the SaaS users, to think more about how this is going to be productionized. Um, whether that piece of data you're, you're using is, are there other pieces of data you would like to collect? Mm -hmm. Is this one really important to collect because it's really difficult to? And encourage them to, to think more about you know, where the data came from and where their model is going to. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great answer. So sort of um, if, you, if you just come up with a model, that basically isn't scalable. You know, it may work perfectly offline, but if there's no way the engineer can do it, you've wasted your time, right? So um, making sure that you really think about how things are, are going to be used and implemented downstream. And then um, I guess as, a, as an engineer, I think um, I, 
I've found that a lot of engineers care less about metrics, um, so they care more about building things. And really, um, to think about metrics also as showing that what you've built is useful. So um, to, to care more about, about measuring your success. To prove you've succeeded. Yeah. I like that. So I would say, from, from a data science perspective, what I would tell engineers is that you know, models are imperfect and they're not going to spit out the same result every time. There are things we can do to make sure that our results are reproducible, but ultimately we're building things that have confidence scores that aren't exactly the same every time. And so I think engineers get very frustrated because they don't understand why things, uh, why things break sometimes, why things don't give them the same answer. And so I would say, you know, try and be a bit understanding about that and, and just don't be as high and mighty about, <laughs> about model performance. Um, and then from the other side, I would say, as an engineer speaking to the data scientists, I would, I would request that data scientists ask more questions. So I think it's really easy to get your blinders on and kind of focus on just the problem that you're trying to solve. You have a specific question that you're trying to ask. You have maybe one or two data sets that you're looking at, and you'll come up with this beautiful solution, and it gives you amazing results. And then you give it to the engineers, and they're like, uh, uh, this has nothing to, like in context, I can't fit this into our platform. So just, I mean, if a solution doesn't scale, it, you may as well not have spent your time on it, right? Like there's more to a solution than just building a beautiful model. So I guess the first thing I did when I joined Cordova was try to understand what my landscape looked like. What is my storage layer? What, what platform am I, am I working with? What's my message bus look like? really getting an idea of the technological landscape and how all those pieces fit together, where are our data sources coming from, and how are we storing them, not just from a higher level, but, but really trying to dig into the details. And I think the more questions you can ask, the, the better you get um, more of a comprehensive picture, and I think that that will drive better models. I think that that will help everyone work together if we understand the parameters that we're all working together in. I think I will tell data, data engineers, if a data scientist come uh, to you and ask you for data, and definitely just uh, ask them what they want with that data to understand the end goal of the pipeline, and then you can align the team together, right? So for data scientists, uh, definitely if you ask data from a data engineer, also try to understand how he collects the data, right? Maybe there are easier ways to collect equivalent data, and you can use for your model, and don't ask for really, well, data is really difficult to collect. Right. Trying to state the problem you're solving, not just the solution you think you want. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have time for, I think, a question or two from the audience. Any questions or comments on uh, data science, uh, engineering versus statistics? Sir? Um, mic's inbound. Uh, it was really nice talk. Uh, I actually have HPC background, high performance computing, so my question will be about engineering. Have you ever in uh, data science faced the problem where you needed the performance and actually need to scale your application at, for instance, Python or Java wasn't good enough and you needed to optimize the code to almost like bare metal? Have you ever faced those type of problems? So yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems like there's always you always want it to go a little faster, right? But sometimes it has to go 100 times faster, or else it's not even a it's not even a feasible option. Mm -hmm. So, to, for example, to what extent have you ever had to leverage native libraries, GPUs? Has that actually come up? Uh, you know, pushing down the native code as an essential part of implementing what the data scientists came up with. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes. You know, when you start out with a project, you may have different parameters that you're working under, like this has to be a batch process that runs once a day. That's a very different approach than something that has to perform the way you're talking about. And I think that you know, if you've maybe started in another vein and then your requirements change or there's something that you hadn't considered, I think your best bet is just to optimize for different things. So maybe you were really concerned about accuracy and so you spent a lot of time collecting training data and really scrubbing it. And maybe that's less important now. You should be able to change your code a little bit to use native objects and maybe like learn a little bit of Scala along the way. I don't know, but definitely work with the engineers to understand how they would help you optimize it and, and be understanding from a model building perspective, how can I change this? It may not be as beautiful of a solution, but it does fulfill the timing constraints. 
I have a question. Hi, I'm the guy in the red hat. No, no, I'm down here now. See, I'm sneaky like that. I'm gonna be underneath the floorboards a little bit as part of my whole Phantom of the Opera thing. Um, I, I love logging and instrumentation of really everything, like everything I can, basically. It is an art form. It is something that you can be really, really good at, um, but most analysts are bad at it, and engineers are like even worse at it. How do we teach people to be better at logging and instrumentation for analytics, keeping in mind, you know, you have to be thinking of what the data is gonna be used for when you're doing the instrumentation, right? How do we teach that? How do we turn that into a practice to a skill? Um, I would say the first step for that is really um, communication. So, you know, sitting down and um, when, when you're putting in um, measurements, when you're putting in logging, um, talking about how it's going to be used uh, what what needs to um, come out of it, uh, if there's additional measurements that need to go in, um, and really just, yeah, sort of building up this idea that it is important, that it's it's a major piece of lo um, launching a product, and you shouldn't you shouldn't be launching without it, right? And so, and then just increasing the communication about what needs to happen so that everyone's really thinking about, okay, well, we need to know exactly when our users do all of these things. How are we gonna get that information? also say that just make it as pain-free as possible as you can. Um, like, have the engineering team build out a layer that, that really a data scientist just has to, like, write a single statement. Make it as easy as possible, um, because that's really the foundation of collecting the metrics that you care about. And so it's definitely up to the data scientist to decide what those metrics are, but then it has to be in a way that's, um, that's implementable and with documentation that a data scientist can understand and not being too complex about it. I mean, don't require all these crazy things that makes our head spins. Well, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'm going to thank our panel, Jean-Ri, Leah, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>